so hi everyone i'm avash and uh don't don't trust what she just said i'm i i, I haven't been debating for for a few years so um this is my attempt at staying relevant i am what you would call a washed up debater or a or an old <laughs> dinosaur but anyway i wanted to talk today about realism in ir debates and before we start with the session itself, I just want to ask a few questions. So you can unmute yourself and answer, or you can type it in chat. But I just want to have a brief understanding of exactly what you do understand when it comes to international relations. So, uh, you know, just in chat, or if you want, you can just unmute yourself and, and tell me what you know about realism or or what it is you think of when you hear realism uh, can i see something yeah go for it yeah so basically according to me realism and ir debates would be you know like making clear how certain countries would go about and do certain things basically the mechanism of things and like making it realistic for example according to the country's past history or what the country's you know incentives of the government structures are yeah that's all. Mm -hmm. okay that's a fair understanding i think um anybody who wants to add to that or might have slightly different opinions Okay, I guess none. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. And there are three things, three specific theories that I want to discuss with you today. And I will make this available to you, the document itself from which I'm sharing. Uh, but I do recommend to also take notes along the way because there are a few explanations that text just won't fail. So let's start screen sharing and um, let me know if it's working for you. Just give me a thumbs up as a reaction if the screen starts sharing. Great. Um, so I'm going to mostly rush over a brief understanding of realism, both classical and neorealism, which is the more common interpretation of it today. And this is mostly because I want a foundation through which to understand the other theories, okay? Uh, the first thing you need to know is that, although it is correct that realism is mostly about, as, as the Smart Club account said in chat, it's about a rational perspective, rationalist perspective, actually, and uh, Shaha, I, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your name, but the person who just spoke before me, um, there were right to a certain degree as well. It is about trying to understand state incent incentives and um, state motivations as a form of responding to them. But to be more specific, so classical realism at least, it has a few inherent assumptions and I won't say they're all true. As soon as you hear them, you know, you'll also have your own judgments of them. But it starts with the downfall of man. And it actually starts with what's called the natural condition of man. If, if any of you know of that, then you can you know, elaborate on chat because this isn't something I'll spend too much time talking about. But the idea is that in the natural condition, all humans are evil, that is, they will cause harm to each other to guarantee their own state of survival. And in order to curb that interest, people come together and form societies to, to purge essentially the worst interests of man. But the classical realist assumes that that state of survival, of self-help is something that still persists today. But it has taken its shape from individuals to countries, or as we like to refer them as states. 
So the idea here is that all states are survivalist in nature. They want to do the utmost best they can to survive. Um, and the assumptions here are that the best way to survive is to dominate others and to obtain power. The more power you have, the safer your state is, the safer your state of survival is. So if man is evil and man needs power to survive, then that logic translates to states as well because it is you know, run by humans. The idea here is that states seek military power because it is in human nature to try and um, empower themselves and to ensure their own survivability. The idea again is that it's because the world is evil and it's because that's the foundation of the world itself, okay? This is an older theory and it's evolved over time to a degree that we have a different name for its modern evolution and we call it neorealism or new realism. Uh, before I continue, just note that if at any point there is something that you would like for me to elaborate on, something that is confusing or something that you find interesting, then don't hesitate to um, send a message in chat or I think it would be more helpful if you just unmute yourself and, and ask me and we'll stop and discuss that for a little bit. Anyway, so we move on to neorealism. Again, a few series of assumptions. Um, so neorealists say that it's not human nature that decides how states behave with each other. Instead, it's the system at play that dictates behavior among states. So they say that the state of international relations of countries and their relationships with each other, it is inherently anarchical in nature. By anarchy, they don't mean a perpetual state of chaos, which is one definition of anarchy. But this definition of anarchy means that there is no authority that can govern all states. So each state has authority over its citizens, right? It has this idea of sovereignty where the highest power is state authority. And that is how they maintain order and control and ensure both compliance and cooperation from their citizens. There is no similar body that can do that to individual nation states, right? Because there is an absence of such a body, all states operate under the assumption that each state is only looking out for its own best interests, which may or may not be true. But because they assume it to be the case, they realize that they need more power to survive, right? That fear from not knowing whether they can trust another state means that they need more and more power if they wanna survive and they only rely on themselves, right? It's a state of self-help. Because this is the system, states seek more power, military, economic, and any other way that you can define power. In other words, it's a zero-sum world. That is, there is no mutual benefit. So for instance, like as an example of what a zero-sum world is, if you look at the game tic-tac-toe, then there's one winner and there's one loser. There is no third state of being, right? You don't have both a winner and a loser as, as one person. You either get something or, you know, you, you're, you're either one position or you're not. So zero-sum games are there where there's always a loser and a winner. There's no in-between. And anarchy assumes such a situation for um, individual nation states, right? So three things that it implies about international relations. One is that cooperation doesn't happen on a true level, right? Which means that whenever states do cooperate, it's because they recognize that this cooperation 
furthers their chance of survival in the long run. But more than that, it's that any cooperation with any other state benefits them more if you look at it from a competitive advantage perspective, then it benefits the other state. You only work with other states when you have more to gain from that cooperation than they do, right? You look at this in terms of relative gains for each state. So if I benefit, and it's, it's not even a competition, right? Let's say we're in a room of 10 people, and I benefit from something. Even if it's the case that I'm the only one that's benefiting, nine other people aren't worsened by that. But in this position of a zero sum world where there can only be one winner, any benefit for one individual person, or in this case, a state, is a loss for every other state. So everything is measured in terms of relative gains. Okay? So if, for instance, I decide, yeah, I think I see um, someone's mic unmuted. Did they have a question? Okay, never mind. Anyway, so if everything is relative, what does that mean about overall security? Um, so, If security is relative, it means that there is no situation in which one state can increase its own security without any other state viewing it as a potential act of aggression or as a potential threat. So if I increase my security, it's because I need to feel safer, right? But if by virtue of me feeling safer, other states feel, uh, feel threatened, then those states also increase the size of their military so that they can feel safer. But if every state does that, then no matter how much you invest in security, no, no, no matter how much you spend for military technology, the size of your military, it never improves that state of security because each action breeds a specific reaction and that creates what is known as the security dilemma, okay? This is particularly important here. Every act of defense is also an act of aggression. Because nobody can really trust each other, every act of aggression is responded with another act of defense, which is viewed again as aggression. Yeah, so it can be between two individual states. It can be more than that. It can be between every state in existence. Obviously, that's not the case right now, but especially if you're, you know, geopolitically close to each state, then you can definitely see this happening in practice. We've seen this a lot with, um, like, if you look at the Korean War and if you look at North Korea and South Korea, every attempt by each individual state in terms of military progress is always responded by a similar attempt by the other state. Am I making sense so far? If, if you have any questions, again, don't hesitate. Okay, so I'm going to move to the first of my three theories that are important, that, that I feel are relevant to debating. And just as a clarification, this is going to be mostly theory today. And if you have any particular motions that you think you would want to see realism being applied in, you're free to send those to me on chat, or you can just tell me those motions out loud and I'll apply the theory here. The idea behind why I give you theory instead of specific motions is that I think once you understand the process through which nations think and apply them yourself, I think that's much more valuable to you than just having case specific knowledge. So anyway, the first of the three theories is balance of power. It shares realist assumptions, right? So anarchy exists and 
every state is only looking out for itself. Okay, the security dilemma also exists. The main goal of the balance of power is that it tries to determine stability and instability based on the distribution and types of powers within the international system. And this is really important because all three of these theories will have a certain explanation for how the amount of power you have in general and in relation to the states around you affects the way that states behave towards you. So if we are going to talk about power, we're going to have to talk about the distribution of power, right? Let's talk about unipolar, bipolar, and multipolar power distribution. The idea of polarity comes from hegemony. Uh, give me a second. So uh, if for this context, this is a realist explanation of hegemony. If you've been studying critical theory, then they have a separate definition of what hegemony is. And that applies for critical theorists. But for realism, this is the definition that's commonly used. It's either a state that can dominate any coalition of all other states in the system, or it's a state that can dominate any other single state in the international system. One of those two is more likely to happen, right? It's the second one. We see this today with potentially the US, where the US as a sole actor can dominate any other sole actor in the system, at least in terms of its military. So it's not very commonly discussed in realist theory. And Theoretically speaking, the theory on how stable a unipolar system is, it, it's very contested. So some people think unipolar um, power distribution is bad for stability. You know, other states have um, incentives to become that unipolar hegemon. And so they're always trying to overthrow the current hegemon. Other theorists say that unipolarity is the basis for all forms of legitimate cooperation within the international system. This one is more commonly attributed to liberal schools of thinking, actually. So that's a different session. We won't be touching on that here. But liberal institutionalism essentially says that if there is a unipolar hegemon, like one state that is so strong that it can dominate every other state. If that is the condition of the international system, it means that cooperation is possible because the unipolar hegemon can essentially threaten other states to cooperate with the set of rules. I see something in chat. I think that was a private message, but anyway. So the second system is bipolarity. Um, bi bipolarity is, it, it's usually considered to be a stable system because the state interaction in, in, in a bipolar system is very predictable. There are two powerful states that rival each other and they have very predictable alliance patterns. There are very specific principles, philosophies and norms that these uh, bipolar states have, and they try to recruit other states based on the same principles and how those other states either choose to adapt to them or choose to respond to them. We have an example in history of a bipolar situation in power distribution. Uh, can anybody guess what that was? You can answer in chat or you can just... Um, Yeah, if you can just um, unmute yourself and maybe try and answer. It's very, it's a very simple answer. Akibia, yeah, you're correct. It's during the Cold War between the USA and USSR. Yep, the Soviet Union. Uh, give me one second. I will just go back to unipolarity for a brief second and we'll move back to bipolarity. Okay, 
So um, unipolarity. Unipolarity is the idea that there is one singular state that has hegemony in the international system. This hegemony can be interpreted in one of two ways. The first is that it is so strong that it can dominate a coalition of every other state in the international system, okay? The second interpretation is that it can dominate every other single state in the same system, right? The idea of unipolarity is that if there exists a state that is strong enough to dominate every other state, there is a possibility for stability by virtue of whatever the unipolar hegemon desires. Because it's so strong that it can dominate every other state, its principles, its ethics, its norms, its rules, they become the basis for international order and they can enforce that order, right? If that is true, then it's easier for other states to cooperate with each other. Because if somebody breaks that cooperation, they can go and bring it up with the hegemon. They can say, look, we made a deal based on these principles, based on these ethics. We signed a pact and they broke it. And the unipolar hegemon can punish the state that breaks that cooperation. Because that threat of punishment exists, unipolarity can hypothetically be called a stable system. Okay? So back to bipolarity. I would like to point out that this assumption is not entirely accurate. Can you tell me why? It says it's a stable system and that state interaction is predictable. Was the Cold War predictable? And if no, then you can give a few examples of you know, instances where states acted unpredict unpredictably during the Cold War. Um, okay, we're hearing crickets. So I would like for you, and you can write this down just as an example, to look up uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, mm -hmm. as well as the Bay of Pigs. And this will just be a reference for you. It's, it's also a good bit of IR information for like whatever reason you might have to debate a Cold War related motion. But essentially the idea is that state interaction is predictable only in theory. And in, in actuality, state behavior is a lot more complex than what bipolarity says. Mm -hmm. There was something about nukes being launched. Um, yep. And Shruti, you're right as well. That was the third coalition during the Cold War. They had a non-alignment movement, which, was, which wasn't in support of either the US or the USSR. Mm. Yeah, the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Bay of Pigs. I'll type it in chat. It was a failed US covert operation in Cuba. They wanted to launch a, uh, a coup. Okay, so we move to a multipolar system. Um, this is very, very important because this one is mostly hypothetical in nature as it is today. It, it was much more um, applic applicable, um, you know, 200 or maybe even like 300 years in the past. So it's, it's said that it's the most unstable system because there are so many hegemons that alliances are always shifting and there is no one true powerful state, right? The strength of that state and the strength of its allies is always changing because everybody is trying to recruit everybody else. 
and nobody is exactly sure of how much power they actually have. I want you to think of, um, especially times preceding the um, the Treaty of um, Westphalia. I'll I'll put it in chat. So if my history isn't wrong, the Peace of Westphalia was around 1653. Um, Maria, the thing about these theories, and this is really important, is that they couldn't predict World War II happening. So if you look at it from a realist perspective, you could argue that the world was in fact multipolar, but several other realist scholars say that that wasn't the case, that there were very clear factions between like the two main sides in, in the world war, but it wasn't so clear that, you know, there was a hegemon for each side because that wasn't the case either, right? Before the war started, the UK and the USA were considered roughly equal in terms of military capacity. So there wasn't a clear hegemon from the Allied side. And from the Axis as well, there wasn't a clear hegemon in terms of like who was stronger, like who was the head? Was it Nazi Germany or, or was it Japan? You know, so there wasn't a clear hegemon for each side. You know, they, their interests aligned and they cooperated. But it wasn't because there was a dominant hegemon representing each side, you know, like the US and USSR during the Cold War. In fact, the, the fact that realist theory can't really explain why World War II happened, at least in terms of its causes, is the reason for some of the other theories you're going to read. Um, the, the, some of the other theories I'm going to explain during this session. Um, so to summarize, for stability, unipolarity, people don't really know. It's, it's mostly hypothetical. For bipolarity, it's technically a stable system and multipolarity is very unstable. So a few examples. So let's talk about balance of power theory. Uh, in, in like a broader definition now. We, we mostly discussed just polarity earlier. So the idea is that under realism, states are always attempting to balance against powers, right? We have this thing called rising powers. And a rising power is a state that isn't the hegemon, but is a state that is gaining power quickly. Okay, the threat of this rising power is reflected in alliances. And these alliances are mostly short-lived. So think of this, the US gains power after the fall of the Soviet Union. What do we expect China to do? And, and what do we expect European countries to do? Anyone? You can answer in chat or by unmuting yourselves. Mm -hmm. Form alliances, but who allies with who? Mm -hmm. Okay. What about the EU? Okay. Mm, 
Vidya, yeah, I think you got it correct. So you expect alliances to be formed with the same type of government and political systems, right? But that's not what China did. So let's look at why that's the case. So there are two types of balances, external and internal. So external is you cooperating with other states or are acting together with other states. And internal balancing is just something that you do within your own country. So externally, you form short-term alliances to balance the power of other countries. So if you look back to the Cold War, you had the NATO, which was an alliance against the USSR. And the USSR had another alliance, but I'm, I'm forgetting the name of it. I think it was called the Warsaw Pact. So the Warsaw Pact was a USSR and its allies associated alliance that was formed directly to balance against the NATO. So we know that this happens, right? Um, yeah, so remember what I said earlier, that realism doesn't really explain a lot about some of the past actions that happen in the world. So if you look at something like this, right, American westward expansion against European colonial powers, this was before the First World War, this was when the US was heading into the Pacific states. You know, this was when they had the war um, with Spain over control of the Philippines, but even before that. During that time, they like the EU, the European powers at that time didn't really balance against the US, right? But balance of power suggests that if there is a rising power, which the US was around this timeline then they needed to either have alliances to deal with the US or to internally balance, you know, for the possibility of war against the US. But this, this didn't happen. So we know from here that realist theory doesn't always work. The second thing we know is that states don't balance power, they balance against something else, which is the balance of threat or the idea of geography. If geography is essentially like, let's say 17th century, the US is, no, let's say 18th century, the US has its independence and um, it's expanding outwards, right? So US territory, it's taking over territory from, from Mexico, from other colonial powers in North America, it's expanding towards, let's hypothetically say South America, it's trying to expand towards, um, uh, let's say Southeast Asia, right? Um, the reason why European superpowers wouldn't balance against the US at that time is because geographically speaking, they aren't really facing the threat of the US. Sure, they lose some colonies, but as long as they're not attacking their direct power base, then they don't need to respond because it's really, really hard to mobilize an army and, and feed supply lines and all the things that are associated with war if you have to travel really, really far from like your home country to do it. We look at this further afterwards. So first, we're gonna talk about balance of threat or defensive realism. And essentially the idea is all of the assumptions for neorealism still apply, right? Anarchical system, all of the above. But defensive realism says states don't balance against power, they balance against threat. So just the fact that a nation is a rising power doesn't mean that other nations will balance against it. The example being the, you know, the US right after the end of the Cold War where they were the supreme nation and nobody tried to balance against them other than Russia 
So hypotheses, right? If the EU and US are allies, the EU doesn't have to balance against the US. Even though the US is the hegemon and its power keeps rising, the EU doesn't see the US as a threat. Because of that, they don't need to balance against the US. But the US and China aren't allies. So China tries to balance against the US and the US does vice versa, right? If it was balance of power, then the EU would also balance against the US even though they are allies, but they're not. Now, a limitation of this theory is that even though it's quite sound, it's really hard to determine whether or not a nation is a threat. Like, if you are China, is the US a threat? Because let's be honest, there's a lot of mixed signals surrounding the US and China, right? They're in a trade war, but, uh, you know, China's largest um, importer is the US and you know the, the largest amount of FDI in China is from American money. So are they really threats? Or you know, are they something that isn't a threat but isn't an ally? Is there an in-between? Right? If you look at Iraq, then is Iraq a threat for the US? Because you know, you've fought a war against them, you've subjugated them, you've Essentially, you've occupied them for a long time, but they're also your Middle East, they're allies in the Middle East. They are your block of operations from where, you know, you expand your influence in the Middle East. It's, it's Iraq, and then you have like your Saudi Arabias and stuff. Mm, yeah, sure. Okay, so just before we continue, one summarizing line on the balance of power for some of the people in chat. So balance of power essentially means that if a state gains more power, if it's a rising power, if, if it's gaining more power, then other states will try to balance against that nation, right? By increasing their own power or by forming alliances, by preparing for potential conflict, that's balance of power. Balance of threat is the same, but instead of balancing because someone has more power than they used to, you balance because you view them as a threat, okay? If you don't view them as a threat, then even if a country increases in its power, you don't take means to um, protect against that increase. So critical to balance of threat are two positions. We have something called status quo states and we have something called revisionist states. This helps um, try to explain some of the limitations so that balance of threat can be applied easier. So status quo states are those which don't wish to change the current balance of power in the international system, right? These are states that they, they follow the norms and rules of the current regime. They don't want to disrupt that or change it in any major way. Whereas revisionist states, they do attempt to change things, right? They're not happy with how things are in the status quo. You know, they want the rules to change. They want the norms to change. Sometimes they're like just rogue states. That's what a status quo state and a revisionist state is. Can you tell me which one is China? Like what um, category it fits under? Chat or through your mics? Okay, so there's a consensus in chat that China is revisionist, right? But if you look at the world today and the position of China in the world, it has been a rising power for the last 20 years, right? And its trading influence has increased, its military influence has increased. 
its significance to the free market is massive just because of how many countries it's in trade with and how many economies it's investing in you know china has managed to make itself very very important to the world as it is today with all its rules and norms and regulations if you really think about it china doesn't really gain much from trying to change the international system it wants to be stronger than the us sure and it does have some attempts that try to say you know look the us as liberal democracy isn't the only way we can do things but those aren't really significant in like the long term like unless the new silk road works out for them the brick and road initiative then the belt and road initiative i'm sorry but unless that works out and it's a massive success then they will be very very happy to remain in the status quo right because if you look at projections they're supposed to take over the us as the largest economy in the world right they have the second largest military budget now and they increase it as a percentage every year they're doing really well on the status quo so you can't really call them a revisionist state like if you want to call someone a revisionist state a, a better country would be well not a better country you know but like a more appropriate country would be iran or some or, or a country like north korea so you see the problem with identifying threat now right is that a country that looks really really apparent as being a threat doesn't really have much of an incentive to change the international order am i making sense do you have any questions for balance of threat yet Okay, doesn't look like you do. Fantastic. And I just want to point out that this is something you can definitely bring up in debates where you know you're talking about, oh, China is going to start a war, or, or or for that matter, Russia is going to start a war, and you can just point out that these countries, both of them, have a lot of things that they want to keep under the status quo. because a lot of these are crucial to the way that these states gain power the incentive of going to war isn't really as much as someone would think it is um anyway let's move on to the the second um alternative to balance of power which is offensive realism a few differences from balance of threat is that it takes into account geography as part of how states act against each other it also assumes that global hegemony is both unlikable and impossible this is for a few reasons the first is because each region has very specific views in terms of norms standards of behavior regulations but also things like culture tradition religion a global hegemon would have to impose its will on every single region in the world it would have to force those regions to conform to the the, the norms the principles and the and the cultural patterns of the global hegemon because it's so unlikable it's extremely likely that there will be a lot of states that are against that and would act violently against that so it's unlikable but it's impossible because geographically speaking you would need a lot of military power and decentralized power at that in every significant region in the world and have that military be prepared for every single act of violence that might happen within those regions so it's not only unlikable 
it's also impossible, right? It focuses on regional dynamics as being central. Of course, global dynamics matter as well, but what happens closest to your borders are as relevant as something that, you know, your local hegemon does. It assumes that there aren't really many differences between states as in geography. So it is a realist perspective, but it's more naturalist in that it says, look, like, you know, if you look at nature, then that state can't really attack us. Or it's more likely that that state who's next to us will attack us than that state who's three continents away, right? So why does geography matter? So, you know, states want power to secure survival and that power is mostly military might. If it is true that states will try anything to get power, then there need to be ways to work around that. And the best way of working around that is balancing through buck passing. So what exactly is buck passing? The idea is that really strong states, like let's say the US or, or China or Russia, they have allies around the world, right? Buck passing means passing on responsibilities to ensure the interests of the hegemon are secured. This is something like having Japan near North and South Korea so that if anything happens, the Japanese can respond, right? They have their self-defense force, but more importantly, they have military bases in Okinawa and, and a few other places in Japan. So buck passing here is having Japan as an advantageous military ally against anything that North Korea and China might attempt. Okay, this is why geography matters, is that if you don't have, you know, something to balance or something to pass the buck, then it's much more dangerous for you as the head of a nation to secure your own country's interests. And that's something that only offensive real, realism acknowledges. And we'll look at that further in, in a bit. So where's the state acting? is one question we need to ask when we're looking at geography. We need to look at what kind of state is acting. And these are the options you have, right? Each combination of the answers for these two questions will result in a different action that that state takes. Um, I'll, we will get to a point where you will be able to answer how would state react for each answer to each of these two questions, okay? So let's look at the importance of what offensive realism has as a theory. So we know that states cannot always try to seek power. Remember the earlier explanation on global hegemons? Sometimes it's just not feasible. There's, there are too many factors involved and you don't have the resources to execute all of those factors. So let's talk about insular states. So an insular state is a state that's essentially isolated and doesn't really involve itself in other regions. Insular states are disadvantaged in regions outside its own because it's not really trying to interact with other nations, okay? But because they're so insular, like they don't really want to interact with other nations and other issues, they're not in threat as much as like a continental power might be. So for example, the US is much more in, in, in danger than you know, another country in that same continent. Like even though Canada is huge and you know, has a fantastic military and economy, it will never be in the same danger as the US is because it's more insular compared to the US, okay? The third thing is that water is a defensive multiplier. What does that mean? It means that if two states are very powerful but have an ocean between them, 
then that is a lot of resources required to engage in war between these two states. I mean, you know, you can definitely have like guerrilla warfare. You can have like small crews of like your, your military go in and cause trouble in another nation. But a full on war is almost impossible because it takes a lot of resources to both have the tools for um, naval warfare. It's a lot of training and it's a lot of time and effort. Compared to that, if your target is something that is reachable via land or via short flights, then it's much easier for you to engage in warfare. Like the fact that you have to consider things like supply trains, right, for the ocean, it makes it so much more of a hassle to engage in war with uh, a rival state that's across the ocean. Like think about it. If the US and China were closer, like for instance, if China was in South America instead of Asia, then you'd see a greater likelihood for war than you know where they are right now. Okay, Malia, good question. Will the war still be difficult given both countries have nuclear warfare, even if there is an ocean? Okay, so a brief note on nuclear war. Does anybody here know what mutually assured destruction is? Uh, Has anyone heard of either of those terms? Yep, both countries will get destroyed because of massive nuclear power. Mm -hmm. It's when you know that you are also fucked if you're fucked with another issue with nuclear warfare. Okay, uh, sure. Yeah, so mutually assured destruction is essentially that. If two countries engage in warfare with, with each other and both of them have nuclear capacities, then if they use those nukes, then both countries are done for, right? Now, a lot of countries have invested in anti-nuclear missile technology, but that research has been banned through several treaties. And the reason why that research is banned is because if you aren't allowed to defend yourself from nuclear warfare, you're much less likely to engage in it in the first place, right? So nuclear warfare is the ultimate equalizer. And it's why most nations, even if they're at war, won't risk a nuclear attack because there is nothing to be gained from it. But that's only the first reason why you don't use nukes. The second reason is more important. And this is directly relating to offensive realism. So um, Malia, thank you for the question. The second reason why it's directly related to offensive realism is because when you use a nuclear warhead, it has a lot of after effects, right? In terms of like radiation damages to the terrain and like radiation poisoning and things like that. So if you engage in war with a nation and you use a nuke, it prevents your own country's soldiers from getting, gaining tactical advantage of having an area that your troops can start as a base of operations from against that state that you're at war with, right? If you take over, let's say, a city by conventional means, then you can use that city as your base of operations, right? You can have the military land there. You can shorten your um supply train and you can refuel you can organize you can strategize strategize better right you have a foothold to which to expand your advantage if you nuke that city then even if that city is no longer beneficial for the other state you don't gain any tactical advantages from taking over that area 
right? You can't land there. You don't want your troops staying there for any extended period of time. So that land is useless to both of you now. Okay, so that's why you don't really see like nuclear warfare in addition to, you know, both actors being fucked. That's a typo. Do countries not invest in Navy much? They do actually, um, but like the US spends a very significant amount of money in the Navy and, and China does as well. And I think Russia does as well, but the problem with naval warfare is the supply chain once again. The US doesn't want to engage with, you know, in, in naval warfare with China close to China's borders because that way it's easier for China to provide aerial reinforcements and other supplies and assistance. Whereas it takes a lot of time for the US to do the same for its own troops. You can say, oh, but Japan is there. But Japan, even though it has a, well, it technically doesn't have a Navy, but um, it, for all intents and purposes, Japan has a functional military. It has this article in its constitution that doesn't allow it to have a military, but they've interpreted the constitution in various ways. And, and it essentially it allows them to keep a military and, and call it something else. But even Japan's military technology, at least when it comes to naval warfare, doesn't match what China can bring to the table, right? So if the US engages in naval warfare closer to China's half of the ocean that separates them, then it's harder for them to win because China can bring in more reinforcements quicker than the US can. Do you think it puts other nations on the back foot if they don't have nukes? Or the Iran deal, because not making nukes is, I think, used as a bargaining chip. I, yes, uh, nukes are a way to get people to the negotiating table. If Iran didn't have nukes, then they would have been had in the same way that Iraq was had. Can we consider the naval base of the US as an example of, yes, we can definitely do that. That's, that's part of the reason why China is acquiring um, rights to ports through its BRI. It allows them to have both an economic and military presence in the countries that consent to um, lending their ports to China. It's, it's a way of balancing, right? Like having bases in other areas, except for your own continent. Is developing nukes an example of internal? It's both. Um, because on the one hand, it is like domestic infrastructure and it's improvements that allow you to have nukes. But on the other hand, having those nukes allows you to both negotiate with rival states and ally with other states that share your political viewpoints and also have nukes. You're under their protection, you know, and the threat of mutually assured destruction is wider because you're allied with other nuke having countries. Good questions. Okay. So offensive realism shows how sometimes states will prevent other states from gaining power and sometimes others won't. Um, it also shows you know, geography and proximity and its importance on military warfare. And it shows that you know, global hegemon isn't something that you really want to have. So what are other alternatives to offensive realism? We talk a lot about something called balancing, like soft balancing. Uh, especially we talk about soft power. Does anyone know what that means? Mm -hmm. So as a general principle, soft power doesn't include 
any form of military threat or economic sanctions. So soft power doesn't include your military prowess and it also doesn't in include like official nation sanction trade. Yep. Um, political instead of military, uh, not even negotiation. Soft power is like Shruti, you're very close to um, how things work. Soft power is getting people to do things that you want them to do, essentially without telling them that you want them to do these things. It's things like Hollywood, right? Where the idea of the US, liberal democracy, free market, and all the values that the US carries is spread inconspicuously to members of other nation states. So that if your country for some reason is against the US, then you as a member of that country disagree with that political choice made by your government. That's soft power, right? It's using cultural tools to align other nations, other individuals, other actors to your way of thinking. So for the US, that's Hollywood, right? Japan has considerable soft power through it, its manga, through its anime, through its video games, right? And just a whole host of these sort of things. Even something like food can be part of soft power. Like let's say the fact that you eat Italian food so much gives you a certain preference or, or a certain leniency towards uh, Italy as a nation and, and some of the political actions it takes. It's a very unconventional way of looking at what power is, but it's quite important, although really hard to explain, just in terms of like fitting it within like balance of threat or balance of power or you know any type of realism. So I will not talk about this all that much right now because you know it takes a lot of time and I would rather think of some other things at the moment. But I will be sharing this uh, matter file after the session's over, so don't worry so much. I can also send you a few academic papers about um, soft power, but let's move on to something else, which is offense defense theory. Um, so, a few assumptions, right? Which is that classical and neorealism assumes there is really no difference between offense and defense. You remember the security dilemma, right? If um, one state tries to feel safer by increasing spending on defense, other states assume it's aggressive and they increase spending on their own defense and it creates this cycle that you can't really get out of. If you look at defensive realism, you have some states that are, you know, revisionist or offensive and some states that are status quo or defensive. What about conflict? Is there a difference between offense and defense? Like in terms of the tools of conflict, strategy or geography? So like at any given point in time, technology, strategy and geography will favor either offensive tactics or defensive tactics. So when military technology and context favor offense, war is more likely to happen, right? But mistakes in understanding that also leads to war and conflict. What do I mean by that? Do you know um, the German military strategy for World War II, anyone? Anyone? Mm -hmm. Blitzkrieg, yeah. So Blitzkrieg is, it's about like overwhelmingly quick attacks that states couldn't defend themselves from, right? 
most of the time, it was through um, yeah, air and ground raids. The reason why this allowed war to happen is because in World War I, most of the war was fought through defensive military strategies, right? You would dig trenches, you would sit inside those trenches and you'd have pitched warfare. It was long and you couldn't really assure victory for either side. It was a toss up of who had the larger force or you know, were you on the high ground or, or things like that. But in World War II, you had air raids where you could fly over those trenches and just bomb those trenches, right? If you didn't have the possibility of air raids, like for whatever reason, if you had anti-air missiles or like, you know, you have mortars on the ground that would take down air raids. World War II was also the introduction of tanks and tanks didn't care about trenches. Like you could just run over the trench. So you couldn't defend territory the way you could in World War I. And that allowed the Germans a lot of success in the war, the, in, in the battles they fought, right? So why is that relevant? World War I, technology favored defense. And World War II, technology featured offense, as I just mentioned, right? Right now, technology favors defense through mutually assured destruction. So just to clarify, do you think tactics favor offense or defense right now? I mean, you know, we say it's the nuclear age, but it's also the terror age. And you have stateless actors that are committing, you know, terrorist acts, declaring war against other nations. Do you think right now it favors the offense or defense? And can you explain why that's the case? Anyone? I see a message in chat. Mm -hmm. That's a good observation, yeah. But do you think it favors offense or defense? Of course, terrorists try to push a certain outcome, but do tactics and technology favor a particular action? Just gonna unmute because it kind of took a lot more time to type. Okay, I think uh, it's it's more like states could either go into the offensive side. I think what the Bush era did with I think Iraq and everything. I think yeah. at the time it could have been shifted into maybe uh, getting the security more strengthened so that uh, the the fail safe that actually led to the 9/11 attack that could have been prevented and uh, still now it possibly impossible to happen right now because of what mm -hmm. happened back then. So I think it is still favoring defense. I think the more offensive strategies kind of create the kind of um, instability that is in Middle East, uh, I, I think it is in Middle East and everywhere else. So yeah, those are kind of my thoughts. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a fair point. Uh, before I tell you the answer, uh, just a point of observation, which is that every cycle is alternative, right? One cycle you'll have offensive, um, you know, technology will favor the offense. The next cycle, the technology will favor the defense because you spend more time trying to counter that strat, right? So the response against the sort of like German ultra efficient attacks was to have a missile that just blows everything up, right? That's essentially what the nukes were like a threat so large that it didn't matter how fast you could bomb people or how fast you could take over territory because these bombs would just kill everything within a certain radius. Mm. I think at the current moment that technology favors offense and 
the key to this answer is the fact that drone warfare is possible. Because one of the aggressors, which is in this case, the states that have drone technology, like the US, like the UK, like France, they can engage in warfare without many casualties, right? Of course, the tech is expensive, the bombs are expensive, but it's easier to justify collateral damage. That's how they phrase it, right? It's easier to justify collateral damage to their own citizens if their soldiers aren't, I can't pronounce that word, their soldiers aren't dying in the process. Because there aren't human deaths with their own side associated with the actions they're taking, they can be more offensive with their tactics. Yes, you have media blowback. Yes, you have news agencies, you know, reporting on body counts. But as long as it's framed as collateral damage and not as, you know, people dying, not as lives being uprooted, then it's easier for these nations to get like military approval, like public approval from their citizens and to engage in this kind of warfare at the current moment, at least. So we're going to skip this for a bit. We're going to skip this. We're going to skip this. The final theory for today is power transition theory. Hmm. So power transition theory says it's not balancing, you know, balance of power or, or balance of threat that causes conflict, but it's about the transition of power and parity among states that causes this kind of conflict. It's a structural way of looking at conflict, right? And it looks at changes in the system, so it's dynamic. The core assumption is that dissatisfied great powers challenge more powerful states. If we look at examples, it's Portugal, then this is way back in the 16th century. Then it's Netherlands getting hegemony after beating Spain in conflict. Then it's Britain taking over from the Dutch. Then the French taking over British hegemony. And all of this ending with World War I. So what's a hegemonic challenge? Most of the time, hegemonies last between 60 to 90 years. And at that point is where other nations usually catch up with the hegemonic nation. And they challenge the hegemony in a conflict. Then there will be a period of calm where countries are just tired with fighting. Like the individuals are done. They don't want to fight. The states don't want to fight. Then they will think of ways to challenge the current hegemon again. And you repeat this cycle again. So power transition theory cares more about the distribution of power than the balance of it. So importance is mostly on relative power difference between states, right? And more than that, it places emphasis on national interest. So remember balance of threat again, where I said that as long as states are satisfied with the status quo and they're improving, even if it might seem that you know they might be a threat, they will mostly focus on their own national interests because they are improving, right? So in this case, what it says for power transition theory, and I forgot to write it, uh, but the idea is if there is a greater difference between the strongest nation and the second strongest nation in terms of power, it's less likely that there will be conflict between them. The idea is that the closer two nations are in terms of how much power they have, the more likely it is that the nation that's rising will try and get into conflict with the hegemon so that they can take over the position as hegemony. If the hegemon and the second strongest nation have a significant difference in terms of power, then there won't be conflict, right? This is also another um, proof, uh, theoretical, of course, 
of the stability inherent in a unipolar power system. Okay. Um, let's look at power transition theory and China. So China rises faster than the US right now, right? If you look at economic growth and just like relative differences in the economy and the military, even though the US is also increasing its power, both economically and, and militarily speaking, the rate at which China closes that gap is, 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 is increasing by year. If China reaches parity with the US and okay, this is important in the status quo, they're satisfied with the international order. So nothing really is going up, is happening. But if they are dissatisfied, then they'll challenge the US and cause um, a power conflict. So the questions are, you know, can China reach parity and, and will China be dissatisfied with the system? This is important. And this was proven to be true under the Trump administration at least, right? So every time we ask questions about like, why does conflict happen and who causes it? There are multiple answers that we need to consider. And all of these answers will lead you to different conclusions, which is why I'm giving you theory as opposed to case because for each case, I can choose a different interpretation of the facts that are available to me and say that one outcome is more likely than the other, or that one outcome is more desired by one party than the other. Um, this is the end of the theory session. And if there are questions or, you know, hypothetical motions that you want me to discuss, the floor is open right now. And I will be sending you this document in chat so that it becomes a part of your uh, IR matter file. There's more material here than I've um, shared today. So that's one positive from, from today's um, meeting. Yeah, so questions in chat, or you can just unmute yourself. I was, can we like discuss uh, certain theories relating to, I guess, Nepal, China, and India, I guess. It's kind of mm -hmm. a unique struggle of power because uh, we kind of are in, in a state where we are, do not really have a power or mm -hmm. like large amount of leverage in terms of how uh, both of these countries kind of deal with us. So yeah, yeah any, anything regarding how those kind of relations work in terms of a small nation and two very large nations being part mm -hmm. of debate. Yeah. I think if, well, I would try to explain it through other theories actually. I think realism is the most applicable in general for most IR debates, but obviously there are different schools of thought in IR, right? You have um, liberalism or liberal institutionalism, which is the more common version that's applied in IR. You have constructivism and you have critical theory. And for the specific condition you said, which is you know the relations between India, Nepal, and China, each school of IR will have a different answer. Um, uh, give me one second, I just need to respond to someone in chat. Okay, great. Um, but if we look at it from the realist perspective, I think I would try to make sense from offensive realism, but also defensive, right? Balance of threat. So China and India don't see Nepal as a threat. That's the first thing we need to understand. That's the start of any possible answer we'll have. We go from that, right? China and India sometimes see each other as a threat, but not always. They've had wars, right? Which India lost. They've had border skirmishes, which India lost again. There's a pattern here. And if I'm not trying to say anything, uh, but just, you know, information. 
So there is precedence for aggression between these two nations, but more than their dislike for each other, it's important to look into account how, you know, they're interacting with the unipolar hegemon in, in place today and how Nepal relates to that. So the importance for, the importance of Nepal is that China will use favors to balance itself against India, right? So Nepal is one of those, um, what's the word, buffer zones between China and India. And China will try to convince Nepal to side with it, right? And India does the same. So there are favors being traded between, you know, India and China, no, no, India and Nepal and China and Nepal. And the intent is to get one of them to side with the other. The reason for this is that it makes troop movements easier. There's a certain point of entry and each state is angling towards having access to that state of entry. There's a third act, there's a fourth actor in play here, which is the US. And the US will try and get Nepal to buck pass, which is if things escalate, um, the U.S. will try and have Nepal there as a way in which they can have influence over that region as well, where they can say, you know, look, we've supported you with certain programs in the past, you know, economically and for your own protection, because situations between China and India are getting worse. We're going to um, send some help, wink, wink, in the form of our military. So if we want to answer from offensive realism, it's not enough to take into account just the relationships between India and China and, and Nepal, but also between China and the US and India and the US. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Thank you. Hmm. Okay. Any other questions like hypotheticals or specific motions. Like, uh, can you once brief about the status quo that is there after the COVID crisis? Like previously, China had good relations with EU and all the other countries, right? But currently, we don't have a clear scenario in international relations over which bloc supports China and how did COVID affect their relations and what is the diplomatic aspect right now? So can you just brief it up if possible? I think COVID doesn't really change much in terms of pre-established alliances, I think. I think what COVID does do in terms of power relations is it has specific impacts on how the soft power of these two nations have been impacted, I think. And I don't think it's a hard decision to say that the US's cultural capital around the world has decreased as a result of how they responded to COVID, where you could argue the opposite for China. So it's not about established alliances and how you know, that changes because of COVID but on more neutral nations and how they view these countries. The perception of favorability is more important now. And having these neutral states think, you know, oh, China looks like it knows how to handle itself. And it, and it makes more sense that, um, it, it, more, it, it makes more sense to actually be in favor of a, a Chinese way of thinking because they have shown that you know, it's, it's possible to do things without following the liberal democratic method. So established alliances, I don't think much has changed, but for nations that haven't completely committed, I think it's likely that they might favor China more. So I would say in terms of relative gains that China has gained a lot more than the US has from COVID. Uh, Bangladesh and their role in India and China. I can't really say that I'm very familiar with the with this dynamic. Uh, 
I will say that, you know, it's very important for you to know what motivations exist, what precedents exist between these three countries and like how they've, how they lean against each other. I think that decides everything. Um, we share a lot of talks and conspiracy theories about bioweapons. Is it a thing to be considered in terms of power balance in the present or its context? I wouldn't say so. Um, there are treaties in place uh, in the UN Charter that specifically outlaw bioweapons. It's why um, the Syrian government using them on their own citizens was such a big deal and which led to Obama talking about the, the big red line. He ended up doing nothing, but bioweapons and their development in any capacity are outlawed under the UN Charter and most nations take that very seriously. Um, is it a thing to be considered? I think like if, if any nation could, you know, secretly harbor a super bio weapon, then it might change power balance to some degree. But I think it's more likely that if that does happen, other nations band together and uh, try and balance against that one nation. So it wouldn't end well for them. Where exactly do realists stand when it comes to the working of a world government, something like the UN having more legitimate power? Um, realists don't want that. Because remember the primary interest of each state is to ensure its own survivability. If you have a global government made up of individuals who have differing loyalties, then there's no guarantee that their state's survival, survivability is guaranteed. Your thoughts on how a possibility of cyber warfare have shifted the balance of power among countries. So just in general, if you look at international treaties and customary international law in general, they lag behind in terms of addressing cyber warfare properly. But I will say that cyber warfare has a significant impact on the way that perceptions change of specific countries and specific individuals within that country. Um, as to how the balance of power has shifted, you can say, I, if I want to be very specific, and I'll talk about the US, and how cyber warfare has affected its perception. I think the introduction of cyber terrorism, but it's not even cyber terrorism, um, just the way in which um, cyber networks have impacted the image of the US around the world. I think that's significantly changed how most states view the US. Um, I think for cyber warfare, um, I mean, it definitely shifts the balance of power, but I can't tell you like what nations benefit the most from mm, the balance of power. Okay, yeah, so Messi, you're right. Um, it is technically irrelevant in that the UN doesn't really have any means on enforcing these laws, but the Security Council can authorize the use of force against nations that are viewed as um, committing uh, specific, there, there are four specific transgressions that are punishable through an authorized use of force. So if it's uh, crimes against humanity, um, war crimes, genocide, and crimes of aggression. Those are the four categories under which the Security Council can authorize use of force. So if the Security Council views that one of these countries you know, that has these bioweapons, and, and these countries are discovered, and they don't follow like legally binding, but peaceful measures of standing down. I think 
it's possible for UN authorized use of force to like, you know, be used against this nation, unless it's one of the five, in which case there'll be a veto. But like um, you have precedents where regional organizations like NATO have ignored UN mandates and in hindsight have been praised in the international community for doing so. Um, and I think in this circumstance, it would be less controversial for a collective action mandate to take place. Like there are some things that are just not done, right? You have like UN charters, which aren't as relevant as most people think, but you also have something called customary international law, which is essentially just like, norms and standards, some of which have been codified into treaties and some of which haven't. But things that most countries will abide by, even though they aren't legally binding, just because it creates stability and order. 